I'm Lee Brown. This is Crazy Shit in Real Estate. Today, we're going to try and break down a little bit of investing for those of you that are trying to figure out how to go from step A to step A and a little bit more. We're not going to go way crazy, but we're going to talk a little bit about some different angles and you're going to get a very nice story. So please enjoy this conversation with Will Matheson. He is a very experienced investor. He's from South Carolina. So obviously, you're going to enjoy the Southern sounds here. I'll see you on the other side. Hello, Will. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. All right. Good listening to your podcast. Good. So I want to make sure we're on the same page because we explained to your booking person, but they don't always listen. Uh, this is not about big investors. It's got to be about mom and pops, VA, real stories, because the bulk of my audience is normal consumers or practicing realtors. Not, um, It's not a bigger pockets kind of an audience. So I just want to make sure you're on the same page with me so you have the right kind of information lined up. Yeah, no, that's that's no problem at all. I can talk about a whole host of things ranging from, I mean, you know, we deal with primarily accredited investors, which real estate agents often fall into. So that's not, um, I, I'm not going to start talking about private equity firms and stuff like that. Okay. Cause even the accredited side is not most realtors. Oh yeah. Well, okay. Cause the average, I mean, realtor, it, the, the average realtor makes about $45,000 a year. Your top producers are making six figures, but they're a very slim margin at the top. And so I try to make sure I'm talking to the the average person. And so that's why I was making it very clear with your booker, because I did have to remove two episodes from people who weren't listening to me because it's my show. So I just want to make sure we're totally on the same page. Okay, let me do this instead, um, because I've done this before. I have spent a significant amount of time talking about specifically if you like scaling up from like not buying single family homes to buying apartment complexes, which you don't need to be a millionaire to do. Like I have this whole like I have this whole like five step thing in terms of start small, start locally, the smaller the property, the more efficient the market is, da 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 da. It's not really a pitch that's made towards you should become an investor. It's just like if you wanted to buy an apartment complex as opposed to a single family house, this is how I would go. Perfect. That will be a fantastic topic for my audience. Yeah. I do have, uh, in honor of the name of your show, I was thinking of a few things that are absolutely crazy that might be worth touching on. One, just because of your clear accent, I'm originally from Aiken, South Carolina. I once had someone tell me that I had the most Southern accent they'd ever heard. Oh, bless them. They must have been from up north. (laughs) <laughs> they they were from up north. I was honestly floored. I mean, my mom is Canadian or was, and my dad's from New York, so I I hardly qualify. I mean, yeah, you don't qualify, but it's okay. You know, we're we're pretty. My nice. grandfather's from Hartwell, Georgia, so that's my claim. Oh, my favorite oh. sunglasses ever are in the bottom of Lake Hartwell. Uh, oh, ooh. you're not going to call it Lake Thurman? No. Okay, we. It's good. To, I mean, you live in North Carolina. You can't pick the South Carolina side. That is South Carolina, not South Carolina. <laughs> I once heard that the reason there's a South and a North Carolina is all the Charlestonians were so pretentious. They wanted to distinguish themselves from the North Carolinians. I mean, that's I never heard that before, but it sounds very accurate because they do think they're better than everybody else. Even the North Charlestonians aren't as good as Charlestonians. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, and this this is probably more so for the brokers involved, so I used to be a broker, a Marcus and Mello chap, and I had a deal blow up at the closing because it was a really weird situation where you had the owner of the property who had seller financing from the former tenant. Or the, all right, let me explain this. There's an urgent care. The urgent care, um, they sold the urgent care and the urgent care did seller financing on the sale or the owner of the urgent care did seller financing on the sale. Urgent care goes dark, so it's an empty building, but they're still paying the rent because they had a lease in place. So, you know, they the urgent care pays the rent and then the rent goes to pay the mortgage. And we had this whole, we had this whole thing where we're going to sell the property and the former owner of the urgent care 
decides to buy it from us. So it's like a reverse of the sale that happened a few years before. Okay. I know. Very convoluted. So hang on, but why, why was the urgent care not open? I thought you could make money in urgent cares. I mean, this was like 2016, 17. The original sale was like Great Recession. I think they might have gotten shut down for some sort of fraud. So I don't know why it was. I don't remember why it was open because this is like. They probably got back in during COVID and did some testing and some masking and they probably made all their money back. (laughs) Well, so the thing on it was the only way we could agree to the sale was if they forgave the seller financing because I think it was like a second mortgage. They had to forgive the loan. Which made sense because it was the guy buying his old property. Giving his own loan, right? He forget the buyer is forgiving the loan he has on the property. So we get to closing and there's a misunderstanding on how much money is due. That there is. And the the seller is essentially like, Well, when we said forgive the loan, or the buyer is like, when we said forgive the loan, we meant you pay it back. It's like that's, that's not forgiving. Same thing. That's not forgiving a loan. So they sue us. They sue us, and in discovery, it comes out that the buyer's broker put in writing, which is just beyond me, well, this isn't what the LOI means, but let's just try to slip it by. So the lawsuit gets dropped, and I'm like, why would you write that? Because there are people in real estate with a low level of information. Anyway, I don't think I'll try to sell that story because it's incredibly complicated, but I'm having it's trouble crazy shit in real estate. I need to get my whiteboard back here and we'll just track who's loaning money to who. But then we have to explain that forgiveness is not the same thing as being paid back. <laughs> yeah. so anyway, Will Mathis, so where do you live? How long have you been messing around with real estate? Give us a little bit of background. So my, I have been buying real estate since 2018 first acquisition january 2018 i was 25 at the time before that my first job out of college was really at marcus and millichap as a commercial real estate broker in north carolina that means i go to the same classes or went to the same classes as all the residential brokers so 90 percent of it was just completely irrelevant to me um i i did brokerage for a couple of years i left i went to columbia university master's in real estate development there and i started buying apartments i literally started with a duplex um i started with a duplex my next deal was six units and then another six units 15 units 24 units you know raising money from other investors but just you know we we started really small because unsurprisingly no one wants to give millions of dollars to a 25 year old unless you're in venture unless you're in tech true and in real estate you want a few more green hairs so when you're when you're thinking about getting into that very first property as a 25 year old, obviously you don't have a pile of cash. And like you said, people don't want to give you money. So, how did you go about that process? Did you buy that first duplex as a primary residence so you could live in one side and rent the other one out? Did you do it old school or did you actually buy it as an investment? We bought it as an investment. So, I was still in the program at Columbia living in New York City when we bought it. The program ended in May. We bought the property in January. And where was it? Like, it wasn't in, it was in Los Angeles. Angeles. Okay. I've actually never seen the property. You still have it? No, I owned it for two months. <laughs> I owned it for two months, bought it for $800,000, sold it for nine eighty five. two months later. How did you buy it with $800,000 while you're in school, not making any money and you're young? So there's uh, one of the things that one of the things that you learned at the program, and one of the things I tell people is, you know, you when, you, when you're when you trying to buy stuff and raise money from other people, the first place you have to start is friends and family. So we went to a small group of investors we already knew. We'd already been real estate brokers, so we had some credibility. The first deal we ever did had actually been in 2015. We didn't buy a property. We put a hard money loan for a million dollars on a property when I was 23, um, which is been a fun thing to try to explain to people. Um, so we had a little bit of credibility and we had a classmate from Los Angeles who identified the opportunity. And he said, look, low market on the rent. We bought it. It was delivered to us vacant. And the funny thing about California, because of the rent control, sometimes buildings are buildings are worth more if there's just no tenants in them. That can really yeah. be any victim anyway if they're in there. 
Well, did you ever watch this show, uh, Silicon Valley, on HBO? There's a, there's a. I didn't watch the movie Pacific Heights, though, and it's a miracle I ever started investing after watching Pacific Heights. So I, there's this line in Silicon Valley where they're talking about, should we, should we try to start making money as a tech company? And they say, no, the last thing you don't want to make money, because if you're profitable, they can value you. But if you lose money, your revenue could be anything. Like it's all, it's all upside. And I almost think of California real estate the same way on the smaller stuff. If, if you have tenants, they can value you. But if there are no tenants, the rent could be whatever you want. So how did your, was your roommate in real estate? And that's how they identified this $800,000 duplex. And you're in New York City. How in the so, world, you know, how, were you, how did you get a plan together on this? Because I will say, the reason a lot of people don't invest out of state is they have no understanding of any market and frankly, don't even know their own all, all the time perfectly. So the idea of investing somewhere else is just mind blowing. So... It was a the classmate. His name was Mitch. He was from Los Angeles, and he had worked in real estate in Los Angeles before coming to Columbia to do the program. So, by def- I mean, by default of being in the program, we were all in real estate. Um, so he brought it to us, made us aware of it, and we joined him on it. Or you know, we got involved, raised a bunch of money because again, it was eight hundred thousand. We'd already raised a million dollars for a hard money loan, so the raise wasn't too much. So that was. And that was kind of how that worked out. I mean, again, there, there's certainly a point of not knowing what you don't know. And I, I'm never buying in California again. We The second deal we did in California, we got hit with emergency rent control. And after that, I'm like, I, I'm never doing that again. So now we're much more focused on yeah, the Carolinas, the Southeast, places. Yeah, I'm originally from South Carolina, so places we know a lot better. Well, and there's a reason the California money is moving here. I have a lot of investors that are cashing out what they can in California moving here. And North Carolina actually has an amendment to the state constitution where we have banned rent control statewide. So even if a local municipality wants to put in rent controls, they can't do it because it's such a negative market factor. But I want to toss out a little uh, note here for those of y'all that aren't heavy duty investors yet. Whenever Will mentions hard money, think to yourself, loan shark, because that is available money at a high interest rate. It's designed to be a a shorter term prog- progress for you because it's generally money you can't get from a traditional bank, but you also don't have all your cash. And they're a great opportunity if you know what you're doing. So let's toss that in there. They're not easy to find right now either because obviously capital is a moving target. Yeah, it's uh, it's not something I've ever bought. Bar- I've never borrowed hard money. I've only been the um, lender on hard money, and it's not something we really do anymore. It was a one-time thing. But it is loan sharks, the best way to put it. But if somebody pays you back, they pay a higher interest rate. You're happy. They're happy. They don't pay it back. They're going to pay the price. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's a very specific it's a very specific place in t- in terms of the market. You see it a lot with um. You see it a lot with flippers, but we were doing it as a more, it was, it was just a different scenario. Okay, so let's let's talk to the normal person who doesn't have friends and family who have money. How do you advise somebody getting started in investing if there, is there a pathway if you don't have access to friends and family money? Yeah, so I always tell people that, you know, if, if you don't have access to other people's money is the common phrase. You really, and even if you do have access to other people's money, start small. I, I know so many people who think they have access to it or actually have access to it. And they say, I'm going to go buy $10 million, $20 million properties and stuff like that. Terrible, terrible idea, in my opinion. Whether you have access to it or not, start, start with smaller stuff. Build your portfolio that way. The market's typically, I would say, less efficient. There's more opportunity to add value and if you're buying a hundred thousand dollar per house, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of value you can typically add to that through a renovation. I have a friend of mine who specializes specifically, and he will find smaller houses uh, in his. I think he's based in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, he'll buy smaller houses all cash, and his whole goal is I want to take a property that's too small to be renovated or not renovated. Sorry, mortgaged. No bank wants to lend on it. And he's going to renovate it. He's going to increase the value to the point where a bank will lend on it. And that, 
increases the price by default because as we're seeing the inverse of the more readily available financing is the higher the prices go so that's just you know a quintessential example of starting small starting local um starting small starting local all right so you mentioned as we were getting started that you like helping people work their way through from starting with one single family rental property into smaller multifamily so two doors four doors six doors a tiny apartment complex how do you help people make that progression because obviously management becomes a question becomes a question of tenant mix and leases and maintenance on the property so things start to change when you go into multifamily so what's your best advice for somebody that's starting to expand a little bit but they're not going to go like giant apartment complex right away yeah so i mean best advice just why I think you should look into multi-tenant properties is it does diversify your income, even if it's the same property. You know, if you have one single family house and, you know, you lose that tenant for two months, you might lose money on the year. And I'm not talking about the good loss that shows up on your tax return because of depreciation and interest. I'm talking about real cash flow losses. So it just diversifies your income. One of the things I tell people is, you know, if you're starting with smaller properties, you can go different ways. I know a lot of people who are going to buy and they'll try to refinance all of their equity, which is increasingly difficult these days. But you know, what we did when we were starting out again, buying a two unit property and a six unit property, we were dead set on buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. Very short term hold periods because the goal was to build the equity. We didn't, we didn't want the cash flow so to speak, because if we could, you know, buy a two unit deal, sell it, buy a six unit deal, sell it, then we would work our way up to buying 15 unit property because we'd just be growing the equity. So it was a lot of churn, for lack of a better way to phrase it, with the goal of moving from single family houses, all your eggs in one basket, to larger and larger, more diversified properties. So the shorter answer to that is buy, sell, Add the value, capitalize on the value by selling, take the money, invest in the next property. Maybe the next one's only a duplex or a four unit or a seven unit or an eight unit, but just keep scaling up so you can keep diversifying your income stream. If you are remotely awake, then you know that we are heading into some really tricky economic times. We have home buyers that have put the kibosh on buying because they have interest rate shock. We have sellers who have found out suddenly their houses aren't dipped in 14 karat gold. And as a realtor, you are still trying to keep up with the business you have and trying to answer questions in the meantime, while also managing sky high fuel cost at the pump. Never fear because my new video course is coming out right now and it's called How to Dominate During a Recession. Look, I've been a realtor for 22 years. I came through the last recession by the skin of my teeth, actually not even the skin of my teeth. My business went up every year during the Great Recession and it's all because of education and getting in front of the curve so that I could serve as many neighbors as possible and help them weather this storm as well. So this course is four modules. There might even be some bonus content for you. And I have priced it so that everybody can get a hold of it and go out there and do great things for the American dream and for home ownership. The price is $199. Click on this link. If you take action, you can be the one who brings great information and great solutions and also paired with realism and optimism into the marketplace that you serve. I am delighted to bring this out as quickly as possible because friends, there's no time like the present to make sure our neighbors are stronger and we protect the American dream. Well, tell us about the the beginning of real estate in your world. So uh, real estate for me, really, it's a, it's a family business. My grandfather was in real estate in Canada. My uncle's a broker in Canada. As seemingly everyone in the family works for CBRE, the commercial brokerage. But my mom specifically was a residential real estate agent in Aiken, South Carolina. She did a lot of lot sales at the time. So I could not tell you how many houses I used to walk in that were still under construction, um, just walking through them, trying to figure out what's this room, what's this room, what's this room going to be. I, I probably walked in a hundred houses under construction when I was like, uh, when I was a child in Aiken, South Carolina. And back then you probably didn't have to wear a hard hat and your mom just said, go out of my way while I'm in the model writing this contract and don't bother me for a minute. 
Oh yeah, no, I I never wore a hard hat. I only got three concussions doing it. Not actually true. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I it was it was the wild west back in 1997. You know, you didn't have to do anything. So why did your mom land in the residential side while the rest of the family was commercial? Was she looking for the faster pipeline to payday so she could brag to them about how she was making more than them? That's my guess. Well, no, it's mostly because, you know, the rest of my mom's family, they, they're, we all, well, they're Canadian. So they're all based in Toronto, you know, the biggest market in Canada. There's a lot of commercial real estate up there. Aiken, you know, Aiken is a growing town back in the 90s, still is. There's just not a big commercial real estate market down in Aiken. So she was, she was mostly just doing it because residential was, you know, where the supply and demand was. Awesome. So, I mean, you say that like it's super easy, but it's not easy. And anytime I'm talking to an investor who's like, yeah, just buy a two, buy a six, buy a 15, it scales up. The average person who is an investor or a low risk tolerance investor hears that and they glaze over because they don't feel like it's accessible. So what are the actual steps that you tell somebody to take? And so if you're talking about buying something and selling it right away, you're paying capital gains. And so what are you what are you looking for there? How are you making money in a short term opportunity? Because with a license, we have to disclose to the seller of the property that we're buying it below market. And are they okay with that? And how do you find people that are okay with it? Give us some of the details for what people can process as they figure out the the how piece, because we can see that you're successful at a young age. The question is always the how, because that's the hardest bridge to gap. And I think it's you know, where Carl Sheets has made so much money over time in his late night infomercials is giving just enough information that people buy the system, but they leave thinking, I don't, I don't know how. So I'm going to touch on two things. One, one part of the question was, you know, paying the capital gains taxes every time you sell a property. The other one was, you know, how, how can you be in a position to buy and sell constantly so what what we did when we were starting out is we only wanted properties where we think we thought we know we can add value we know we can buy it at max and we'll do this capital infusion and we're gonna sell it for why because you know we weren't gonna buy a new construction property there wasn't any value to add the value that we add you know we had to look at it and say if we invest, you know, 40,000, whatever number, if we invest $40,000, we're going to increase the value of the property by $100,000. So that's 60,000 of profit. You know, it, it had to have a value add component because you're just, you're not going to be able to do that buying and selling and buying and selling if you're buying a new construction asset or you're buying a, a recently renovated property. As far as the taxes go, there is something that a lot of people, some people know about, some people don't, but it's called a 1031 exchange. So a 1031 exchange, for those who don't know, is essentially, I, I refer to it as this game the federal government created where you don't have to pay a cap. You defer. Let's not call it games. Let's just say it is in the tax code. It is an opportunity for investors in the tax code. Well, I, it is an opportunity for investors in the tax code. It's a much better way of phrasing it. I just, I do find it kind of funny. You identify, you sell your property, you have 45 days to identify three potential replacements. You have to close on them within 180 days of the sale. And by doing so, you defer your capital gains. It's it's an interesting series of events. Um, you can split your exchange, you can buy multiple properties, but it allows you to defer your capital gains. And I've seen... So many cases of people where they seemingly bought a property in 1984 and they're still 1031-ing that money today and they've never paid a capital gains tax. Well, not yet, because they will. Because one of the myths about the 1031, as you kind of referenced, is people call it a tax-free exchange. It's not tax-free. It's tax-deferred. It's just deferring until you finally hit the end of that road on the property ownership. But the, the thing I wish they would fix about the 1031 right now with the market being so low inventory, we need 180 days to identify. And then I can close in 45 days. They got those dates backwards and it'd be sure nice if they fixed that. Well, I, I will add one qualifier. It, you can essentially almost defer them because the basis, is, the basis will reassess if you pass. 
and then you pass it on to your children and they would get taxed at the new basis. So you can, if you, if you play a very long game, you can almost completely avoid it. But yes, the, that's the thing I've never liked about 1031 exchanges. You have to, it is somewhat of a leap of faith. You have to say, I will find these, pro this property in 45 days. And I'm sure you've seen it as well. A lot of people say, well, I'm going to find my exchange property before I even agree to sell my property. And that's just, no one wants to, no one wants to sell you a property if they know they have to wait for you to now find a buyer for yours. And it's, it's very complicated. I'm personally, I'll be honest, I've never actually done a 1031 exchange. We always paid the capital gains. Oh, I just closed one last month. Not only paying taxes. And so I will go through all the headaches and the hoopla to avoid paying my taxes right now. I pay a little. Defer paying your taxes. But you know, you, and by the way, we're not attorneys or tax advisors. You should always reach out to a, an attorney or a tax advisor if you have questions about any of these strategies involved. Okay, so you said that you have a, a system that you walk people through when they're trying to figure out how to buy a property. So first of all, where are you finding properties in the market that we're in right now? Because there are just not as many properties on the market as usual. We're typically looking at apartment complexes, but it's anyone who bought in 2020, 2021, who used a bridge loan or floating oh. right debt. They're under, they're under a lot of pressure right now, but that might be a little more specific to multifamily properties. Where I hear all of the opportunity in rental property or single family homes and smaller part properties is really Airbnb. People who bought properties to Airbnb them a lot, sometimes it's working, but in some cities, I think Austin, Texas, Nashville are the ones getting hit particularly hard. Have you, you seen you, Gap in Austin? I, my wife is from Austin. So my, I still follow that market, but Airbnb owners are getting hit somewhat hard. I, well, yeah, because when the economy goes sideways, one of the first things people stop doing is vacationing, and that hurts the Airbnb market. But such a saturation in Austin is crazy. Let's see. I have to find this heat map because it is wild to see. So one of, one of the things that I, I've had repeated conversations with, and I don't know if this would contradict, I'm sure this probably contradicts somebody else, but I think... When you're looking at buying a property, the only way you should analyze, I shouldn't say the only way, but when you're analyzing it for rent, you have to analyze it from what would a normal market rate monthly renter pay? Because a lot of people talk themselves into, well, yeah, I might be able to rent it for $2,000 a month, but if I rented it on Airbnb, I could make four thousand dollars a month so they take on a twenty five hundred dollar mortgage and a lot of those people are are really in trouble right now again I, I think nashville and austin are the quintessential examples of that in today's market and that's a great point plus they're not factoring in vacancy rate which back to your point of that market rate renter there's not as much vacancy rate involved so here's the heat map in austin right now this is Ooh. the total number of houses for sale that's the airbnbs the, the whole house. Say so the thing says there's thirty. This was we're recording this on September eighth. This heat map was from August nineteenth. So I'm sure it's fairly accurate. Thirty three hundred twenty nine homes for sale. Twelve thousand one hundred twenty seven whole house Airbnbs. Because somebody was like, well, how many of those are are condos? And she's like, these are the whole house Airbnbs. And so you're you're spot on because all, all those aren't bringing in the numbers that they hope. So it could be great opportunities to help somebody not be underwater on their house. And so you don't, don't just look at it as you're taking advantage of the market. You might be offering an out to somebody who needs an out and hasn't yet looked for one. So that's a great point. Well, I mean, you know, any any buyer who is in trouble from overextending themselves into the, or not, I should say buyer owner, any owner who's overextended from 2020 or 2021, you know, they... They really are in a tough position. And yes, you, you know, if you buy their property, even if they're losing some of their equity, it certainly beats a foreclosure because no one wants a foreclosure on their record. It, it hurts you for the next, what, seven years yeah. in terms of well, applying for loans. So yeah, I mean, look, obviously they would prefer not to be in a tough position, but if you can buy a property from them in a way you're doing well by yourself and you're helping them at the same time. And that's a win-win. 
Okay, so as an investor, what are you seeing out there as far as trends? And what are you, are you, are you looking in, you said North and South Carolina, but are you preferring the C-class properties where you can renovate it? Do you prefer to find 15 units that have a manager on site? What is your sweet spot and where do you think we're headed with the shortage of housing in the market? So from a housing perspective, or from a supply and demand perspective, the South, East, the Carolinas are still just absolutely phenomenal. Um, you know, the just more people are moving here every other day. I think in one of your recent podcasts, you referred to them as economic refugees. That is correct. Um, you know, the Ohio license plate is very common down here in Charleston, South Carolina. And Myrtle Beach. I think they all go to Myrtle Beach first and then the fancy ones go to Charleston. Well, it's a rule. I, I haven't I haven't spent a lot of time in Myrtle Beach, so I can't I can't say anything about that. I'm boring. I'm not a beach person. Why don't I live in Charleston? You just got to go sit I, and watch. It's like Walmart outside. Uh, I've yeah. I I the last time we took a look at a property up there, I wasn't on that trip, so I did I did miss it. But supply and demand, it's still phenomenal. But the financing, you know, we, we see all the graphs and, you know, some people like to, you know, try to go out there and say, oh, it's better to rent because buying a house is more expensive than renting. So that, that makes investment properties difficult right now. So it is kind of hard to your point to buy a nice renovated new construction, whatever it is with the idea of renting it. Because there's almost no way to cover the cost. If your mortgage is five thousand dollars a month, you're probably not renting the place for five thousand dollars a month. So that's that's tough. The real opportunities, you know, in our industry, we I, I'm now seeing more and more properties every month that are selling for less than they sold for. And I know in one of the recent episodes as well, you talked about you know people say date the rate, marry the price um, is not the best word of advice, but. If you can buy from someone who has to sell, it's a pretty good spot to be in. You know, if it's a bad time to be a seller, it's generally a good time to be a buyer if you're smart about your financing, which is a big if. It's a big if, but if you're smart about it, I think it's a good time to buy. Well, that's why I don't care about the price. I care about the payment. And so if the payment they can live with, the price is irrelevant. And that's where people just get distracted by the wrong things, which is also... You know why they're afraid of of investing? They they heard a bad story about somebody had a bad tenant, and now they're making assumptions, and they never get started. Ten years from now, like man, wish I'd have bought more real estate. And there's something everybody has said since March of 22 when rates started to climb is, oh, should have bought more real estate when rates were low, and I should have bought more real estate myself. But you know, glad to have what I have because it allows you me know. to be one of those people bringing housing into the market. So I will say, even as a guy who, you know, my, my company, we buy apartment complexes for a living. I will say I was among the people who was sitting there in 2020, 2021, looking at single family homes saying rates are so low, they're going to go up. And, you know, when they go down, the housing prices will go down. And I remember all the bidding wars of 2020 and thinking $50,000, like in Charleston, it's like $800,000 list price. It sells for $850,000. It'll come down. It'll come down. Same houses are worth like $1.2 now. And, the, the, and, you know, the, the thing that we didn't understand properly or what at least I misunderstood is people have that 30-year fixed rate mortgage. It's not 2008 with you know, negatively amortizing loans, variable rate mortgages, they're 30 years, they're fixed rate, they're under 3%. People are going to hold on to those properties for dear life because they know they're never going to get a mortgage that cheap again. So that's, it's keeping the supply down. So I'm curious about your veterans project that you have. Tell us a little bit about what you're working on there. So yes, in, in the spirit of housing, I am currently the president of Low Country Veterans Home. It is a, a transitional housing program for homeless veterans in the Charleston, South Carolina, MSA. Um, we house veterans for up to 120 days, give them a place to stay, three meals a day. We help with job training. We work directly with the VA to provide any medical service that they may need, all with the goal of you know, you're in here for 120 days, you get your feet under you and we get you permanent housing and we get you back into society. Uh, you know, we, we don't want to be, we don't want you to be there forever because then it just becomes a crutch. Uh, but we take you in, we set you up, we get you out. We have 
very phenomenal positive graduation rate. We've had over 100 graduates since we opened in November of, it's probably over 150 graduates since we opened in November of 2020. That's awesome. So those 150 graduates, how many of them have gotten some establishment for themselves going and are making it out there? Well, so I, uh, the 150 graduates, they all, they all exit our program going into permanent housing of one form or another, be that, you know, renting somewhere or whatever. So all of those qualify as what you just asked about, like getting back out there and reintegrated into society. That is good stuff. So where does the money come from for that? Is that your, your apartment company is helping fund it? The VA helps fund it. How do you purchase? that property and how do you make it make sense because what you're describing there is something i think a lot of people would want to replicate because it's doing good with housing even if they don't really make a lot of money on it and so what are the what are the things to look for in that do you have to have special zoning and permits for transitional housing and what are some of the pitfalls you've encountered so there, there is specific zoning that needs to be in place you can't just open one anywhere we actually were able to our our group, Low Country Veterans, official name, legal name is Senior Housing and Resource Management. Long story there. Don't worry about it. It is an officially recognized 501c3. We own the house where the program is based out of. We actually bought the house because it was facing foreclosure. Uh, it was in a pre-foreclosure situation. And it had previously, or it was, a homeless veteran shelter. So the reason we wanted to buy that house is because it was a non it was a pre-existing non-conforming use so it could be grandfathered in. I might be getting the term wrong. So it's very important to buy that specific house. Um so we bought the house, uh raised a lot of money for that, but typically our funding, a lot of our funding comes through our fundraising. A lot of it we have a contract with the VA, so for every night we sit there for every night we house somebody, they pay X amount. It's a very difficult contract to get. Our founder, Leslie, did a phenomenal job getting that. And uh, that's what's really allowed us to help so many people, in addition to all of our donors and our fundraising gala and all that stuff. But I would think like of all the things you're doing, that's got to be the most fulfilling thing because you're actually watching your knowledge of real estate give somebody else an actual hand up and not a hand out. Yes, the uh, the whole reason I ended up being involved is the founder said, I'm looking to buy this house. And I thought I could probably help her on how to raise the money and make sure we structure all of that properly, get the financing and uh, commitment just escalated more and more. And now I find myself president of the board. So no, it's it's truly great. We've impacted a lot of lives, um, impacted a lot of lives for the better. We've helped a lot of people. And yeah, we've. Yeah, we continue to work on growing our mission and helping more and more people. That's awesome. Okay, so if somebody wants to reach out to you and they're the more advanced person who says, Lee, quit asking questions. I want to hear more about big stuff. And they want to reach out to you. Or if there's somebody that's a slow investor, slow burn like I am, and they want more, or they want to learn how to copy what you're doing for your law country veterans, what's the best way for them to find you, Will? So I'm pretty easy to find, I think. I like to think on LinkedIn, just Will Matheson. And they can also email me directly at will at mathcap.com. That's M-A-T-H-C-A-P dot com. And as usual, all of Will's contact information, handles and links and all that are in the show notes for this episode. So feel free to reach out. And if you're going to make the transitional housing a reality where you are, make sure you tag us both in. I want to see some of that good stuff happen. And if you learn how to invest and get yourself started, you should let us know that too, because you've got to take charge of your financial future and real estate is tangible. It doesn't go anywhere. And frankly, it's where I prefer to be other than the stock market right now. So if you picked up a little bit of information here, drop it in the comments. Will, we appreciate you coming on and giving us a lot of different little angles and insights here and there. And very much, very appreciative of your time on the show. Thank you for having me. All right, guys, check these links for more information. Check the show notes, follow up with Will, and we'll see you next time. So if you found value in this episode, please like and subscribe to this channel. Turn on the bell and catch another amazing episode by clicking above. Crazy Shit in Real Estate is also available on all of your normal podcast apps. 
So if that's where you like to hang out, go find me, click subscribe. And most importantly, leave me a review that says you think I'm awesome, my guests are awesome, or this content is just exactly what you were looking for. And then by the way, if there's something you need, you wanna learn about something, you can comment below anytime. You can also send me a direct message if you need to remain anonymous, no judgment. But anyway, I'll only judge if you forget to subscribe and click. I'll see you next time.